my first Lamborghini. It was, uh, it was a pretty hard conversation to have with my family. All right, well, welcome to uh, one of the first podcasts that's gonna be on this channel. This is Mario's idea, so if you don't like it, please write Mario at Royalty Exotic Cars. <laughs> he will then uh, probably respond with uh, some excuses, and uh, then we'll make this podcast better. But for now, the first guest of my podcast, which I don't even have a name for my podcast yet, so if you guys wanna chime in and let me know a good idea. what you think the name is gonna be for the podcast. Mm -hmm. For right now, we'll use a placeholder, call it the podcast. I like it. And uh, our first guest is Robbie. <laughs> Straight and simple right, right to the point. Robbie's my older brother, he's my half brother, so He's uh, not my full brother, so any things that you don't like about him are not from my side of the family, they're from his side of the family, okay? <laughs> That's a good one. So, yeah. I like that. Yeah, they're from your mom's side. Yep. Uh, and no, it's a crazy story, because your father actually hung out with my mom more than any other person, so we're still trying to figure that story out, and maybe we can tell him about that story a little bit. Yeah, we could. I'll get into it. So um, okay. basically, Robbie was born as my cousin, but uh, we did a uh, paternity test, and it turns out that we are half brothers. Um, <laughs> nobody in our family actually knows this yet. Only us. Uh, only us, um, and all of you guys. So if you know any of our family members, don't tell them because we're waiting for a couple of them to die off before we, we break the news, so that it doesn't cause any drama. <laughs> it's, a, <sighs> it's a true story, though. It's complicated, but when I told my father that I knew, he responded with, not no that's not true correct he responded why would you want to ruin my brother's life <laughs> that was his response and so i didn't even have to do the test and uh, i figured it all out so it was all in the proof was all in the pudding <laughs> i said uncle frank you know actually you're my dad and he was like wait how do you know you know, <laughs> he kind of looked, at, he looked at me and oh you're kidding you know he does this yeah. you're kidding me but, so that's why robbie's my brother cousin <laughs> my brother cousin yeah because uh, for a very long time, he was my cousin. And so actually, Robbie and I grew up together. And I really never understood the reason why when I turned 16, my dad bought me a Scion XB, little milk wagon box truck, and bought Robbie my dream Mustang the next day. So I always wondered why. And now it all makes sense. Because he was compensating for the time he had lost when Robbie was a child and being raised by his... Um, his uncle father. There is so <laughs> much truth to these stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So now everybody's figuring it out. Like the things that you don't hear about what growing up, you know, Houston, uh, we actually had our, our, an apartment together. We shared furniture. We had two separate rooms. When I was we 16, when high we school. 16, yep. We actually owned a, a TV business together. So we were doing installations of TVs and speakers, you know, and so sound systems. And uh, we started doing that. We started buying cars and building my credit. <laughs> it was It's just crazy, like growing up. And he was literally like my little brother. And I knew him more and like to be around him more than your your cousins. My cousin <laughs> Robbie has so uh, much truth. Um, six cousin sisters and one. <laughs> this is this is getting out of hand right it's, now. But it's all true. The <laughs> and and your other uh, step brother. Yep. Yeah. It's a long dramatic story. It is. But uh, I'm glad that we got to finally air it out. Talk to everybody about it. Um, I don't know if you knew that this is what we were bringing on the podcast today. I didn't even know. Just it. opening up the book of Family Cross the Secrets. Correct. Yeah. But uh, that's where we are today. And now that we're here and you're on the channel, which is great. What do you think? I changed the name of the channel from Royalty Exotic Cars to my personal name, Houston Crosta. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good choice. You know, the, the thing about it is, is royalty has a big, huge statement. And when you think of royalty, and just the other day I was driving, took a picture. I don't know if you've seen it, but it was an air conditioning company and it said royalty AC. And I was like, we could sue them. See, that's what I mean. I, um, I own the royalty trademark. Every time I see like royalty tolling, obviously that's our guy, you know, it's just, it's a statement in itself. So when you say it's royalty, I, because yes, I work here and I know YouTube and Instagram and TikTok and just Houston's hot chicken of Houston Crosta. So now when I think of Houston Crosta, people already know who you are. So it's a huge statement to change your name. It's very like, wow. Well, part of the major reason is because 
every time I buy a car uh, for myself, mm -hmm. like the Agera or a Veyron or something, people assume I'm going to rent it. And it's starting to kind of like, I don't want to say bother me because I don't really I care. Yep. But like, I don't want to distract from all the hard work I put into all the other companies that I have. Yeah. And I earn, you know, royalty doesn't pay for a, a Koenigsegg. Like anybody in the rental car business knows that there's no money in this business. And there's enough money to pay the bills and the salaries and everybody here, maybe get a new car once or twice a year. But um, all my money is coming from my restaurants and my auxiliary businesses that support royalty, yep. right? So the car wash, the mechanic shop, the car dealership, you know, all those things. And so like, I feel like royalty is becoming such a major part of my brand that I, I want to, I don't want to distance myself from it. I just want to distance myself from being the only thing that I do. Correct. Right. So by being in the name of the channel, it almost defines my lifestyle as royalty. Correct. So like, I feel like if I, when I change it to Houston Crosta, it makes more sense. Like it gives me overall brand equity for growth. Right. I mean, Houston's hot chicken is, you know, HHC, it's a billion dollar business. I mean, the chicken wars, uh, have started maybe 2017, but we haven't even gone out of the country. We haven't opened our first store out of the country yet. Yeah. And this is, we haven't even scratched the surface. I mean, we're, we're talking major, major, major moves with that business. So my point is, is I just don't want to be defined as royalty. That's what I'm trying to say. I understand. It is, you know, sometimes you, you know, I'm sitting behind the desk or doing something and someone will walk up to me. Hey, Robbie, what's up? Seeing you from the channel. Oh, hey, you know, do you guys rent out the Koenigsegg? You know, you kind of look at somebody like, are you serious? That's like, I mean, honestly, like, like, let's just say I, I think that car is worth probably low force um, because the sale that happened with the Phoenix, right? That was a little more than 5 million. I think that, you know, when you really think about it, right? Let's say, put the Veyron into perspective. Um, the original Mensori Veyron that I had purchased when I was like, I don't know, 27, 28, something like that, uh, was 1,250,000. I never wanted to rent that car, but I put it on the website because I wanted the marketing value of it, right? I wanted all the journalists to pick it up so you can rent this car in Vegas. Now, I would have rented it to someone that wanted to put it on a trade show, never to be driven like on public roads by someone else because that was a really big, that's too big of a reli I mean, a liability for me. Or because the car gets damaged, an insurance company will pay for it. But the amount of time that it would be down, it would be so disadvantageous exactly. to, for me to like even take that risk for. And that was at that time twenty five thousand for the day. So we had uh, a few people ask about it, but when you think one million two hundred fifty thousand for a Veyron, which there's there's Veyron parts available. I mean, I just rebuilt the Galveston flood car. I call it Scuba. So when you refer to scuba, that's that's what I'm I'm talking about. But I just rebuilt scuba and I got pretty much the entire car from Bugatti. I mean, honestly, like I replaced at least 80% of that entire car. Yeah. I mean, the carbon tub is original, engine block is original, the gearbox is original, but pretty much I mean the turbos and the fuel lines and injectors and air filters and charge pipes, all that stuff is new. So th there was parts available, right? But do you look at a Koenigsegg? Uh, let's call it four million. There's only one non RS Koenigsegg in America, and that's my car, right? Yeah. There's eight RSs in America, and the parts are completely different, right? So, like, how could I even replace something like that? I mean, there's less than 30 Agueras that were built worldwide. Where am I going to get these pieces? So, what would the value be to rent the car for the day? What would you think? Or that car? Yeah. <laughs> it's not possible, right? You can't. It'd be like $100,000, like a, a mile. Like I, I wouldn't. If I mean, someone offered 100000 <clears throat> if they wanted me to put it inside of a trade show, right, I would charge them, you know, like $20,000, right? Yeah. Like, I would have no problem putting it in a convention center around a booth or something like that. Yeah. But, like, if somebody wanted to come in and rent the car to drive it, I would just say no. There really isn't any anybody. Like, I mean, before... Uh, Julius bought his Phoenix. 
I let him drive my car. For him, I, I trust him with any of my cars, right? Of course. So that would be the only way that anybody else would drive that car besides me. Because like, there's no monetary value. It would just have to be one of my close friends or, you know, maybe like you just take the car to the car wash or something like that. Or, you know, down the street to get windows tinted. Yeah. There's, there's just no way to, to rent the car to someone else. Craziest part is, is that you guys need to understand is when you really fathom what we do, the thing that blows me away about my brother is like, we're not talking just, you know, Twin Turbo Viper. It's, I'm not saying it's a back car. I'm saying it's fire, right? But we're talking Koenigsegg. This is out of the realm of anybody's budget. It's very significant to what he drives. And that's a car that I didn't expect. We used to talk about this for years, and then he pulls up in it. Bottom line is, is we went to go look for it. Now, Houston separates himself from the norm in the world because I have, not first of all, you, who the hell do you see? And answer this damn question because everybody wants to know. And you guys can ask the questions too. Who the hell drives an Aguirre the way you do? And it's the most beautiful car I've ever seen and gets to do what you do in that car. And it's a daily driven car and we're doing donuts and you actually drive the car like it's your car. Right. You don't just garage it. I've never seen you grow any of your cars, even if it's the Veyron, like it was garage, but you actually drive the car and enjoy it. Why? Um, well, I guess my dream job was to be the Koenigsegg test driver. <laughs> that, we, we just saw a video about yeah. that today. It was amazing. Uh, I mean, like 10 years ago when they, the, the drive or one of the publications went to the Koenigsegg factory and this 23 year old kid is over there just doing 200 miles an hour just with the steering wheel like left and right slam on the brakes the eyes closed i was like wow that's the job i want in my life yeah. i couldn't get that job because i wasn't qualified right i don't live in sweden and um <laughs> i uh i'm probably not even that good of a driver so i had to figure out how to buy one to have that right so like i don't know when i started royalty i started it because i wanted to build a car business for car guys like the unlimited miles thing wasn't even like just for a backtrack i'm the first company to offer unlimited miles on a supercar ever and like, I didn't do it to edge out my competition. I did it because I thought it was natural. Right. Why would you want to be restricted on these cars? Why would you want to have that anxiety? Right. So the same process is when I bought my first Veyron, why wouldn't I do donuts in the car? Like I, it was natural, <laughs> right? Why would you? I, I mean, it really was, you know, like why wouldn't I pull the axles out of the front and to see if what it did rear wheel drive? Yeah. You know, like it, it, it to me, those types of things just become are just normal like they're normal processes in my brain yeah. right i never look at a car like oh my god that's too expensive i don't want to drive that or i don't want to touch that it's relative right i'm not saying that i'm like super rich but like i purchased the car because i know that a i can afford it and and b that i'm going to drive it with like endurance you know i'm going to put some some real miles on the car exactly i, I literally drove the car a thousand miles in two days the Koenigsegg. Yeah. Well, a thousand miles in two days. And I mean, not saying that I should have or not should have, but the speedometer had a two in front of it multiple times, you know, in, in safe areas. Of course. Right? No, and, 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 and it's and, like on closed roads. But And I you know. see a lot of the comments and I'm just letting you understand. I'm not trying to back anything up, but he is one of the most safest drivers I've ever been. And I'm, I'm in the passenger seat nine times out of 10 or Mario or Tony. There's really no one else. He lets drive in the car with him. And me holding the camera, I mean, my my hand is locked. and I'm like, oh my gosh, but he doesn't do that stuff on just, a, you know, one going on, one coming on. What and, he's saying and is fearing. I don't drive like Edmund. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually impressive. When we go up a hill, you think he would like, you know, cut over and into the lane. He doesn't do that. Yes, we, you know, when you go around cars, you drive around, you know, the car to get into a safer spot. But like I said, um, when I first came here and you invited me, what, when I started working almost three years ago, I used to remember when I used to walk in here and be like, oh my gosh, that's your GTR. And we started out doing that. That's how it all started. It's like, true. Yeah. We can go on this whole podcast and talk about, and I can just ask you questions about how we first started because I know the whole story. We li we were neighbors and, you know, it all started then. Um, yeah, actually, Robbie and uh, his ex wife and, and myself and my wife lived in the same street. Uh, in a neighborhood here on uh, in Vegas, and Robbie saw me starting royalty, and then I sold my house to buy my first Lamborghini. It was uh, it was a pretty hard conversation to have with my family. Uh, I remember that story very well. Like yep. I, I mean, everybody thought I was an idiot. My dad had 
he start he actually bought the first 09 DTR. We talked him into it and he picked me up from the dentist's office. I got my molars taken out and he pulls up in his car and I'm like, Oh my gosh, Houston, he bought it. And so then, you know that I don't know if you know the story, but he asked me to find him one in well, 2008. Remember that? And I, uh, I called every single car dealership in the country. It's like 18 year old kid. I mean, I was like literally the greatest opportunity of my life at that point. Wall Street. Please find me a GTR. I was like, what? You're going to buy that car? Yeah, no okay. way. <laughs> and this is brand new. 09 was the first year. Correct. They were $68,000 new, something like that. And I swear I must have called 200 people and some guy in Colorado. In Colorado, yep. Exactly. Answered the phone and said, yeah, I've got a silver one here and we'll sell it to you for uh, whatever like the price was. No, no, it was it was like 74,000 or something like oh, that. Okay. It was just, I think it was 68,000 plus the silver was an extra couple thousand dollar color. And then, you know, they had like the dealer add-ons, yeah. but it was, it was like super cheap compared to what they cost now. Correct. And um, yeah, then and Bob went up there and, and he just drove it back. But that was like, that was my first time I'd ever really like, I don't want to say that we're brokered because I don't broker cars, but helped someone buy a car, mm -hmm. you know, found it for them and everything. And I remember sitting in the backseat of that car, like we're getting dropped off to the Sun Coast, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, and the Sun yeah, Coast. it was like his favorite spot to gamble. And I remember sitting in the back seat, getting out as like an 18 year old kid. I was the coolest guy at that uh, and the whole casino I was like yeah I know that even guy has that car if, even if we walked out of the trunk like <laughs> opened it up it and didn't like, matter you know, it, it was, that was the greatest car on, on the planet earth at the time you remember how it really actually first started obviously you know the Ferraris and all that stuff but it started in 04 or I'm sorry yeah 04 correct or was it 03 when 2000 we got, it was 2003 with the 2003 Cobra correct because we yeah. had the first one like yeah. literally 52 miles on it yeah he pulls up in front of Nona also Papa's silver house also, also silver, silver revs it up me and you come outside and yeah. we're like oh my I, I god never, he, what he took us hell? up he took us up took that us street up Sun City or whatever. I was sitting in the back and mm -hmm. hearing that supercharger whine oh man that was like I couldn't that's the defining moment I mean actually the real moment for me to, to like cars was when I, I looked at a Ferrari book that he had. He had like a Ferrari book. He was showing me what the cars cost. And I remember telling him, I was like, I saw a commercial for like a Kia or something online or on, on TV at the time. And it was like $12,000. And the price of Ferraris was like a hundred and something at the time. And I went, Bob, 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 you don't have to pay that much money for a car. I, I saw one on TV. It was only 10,000. And, <laughs> and, and he went and he went through the whole story and the spiel about how the cars are different. And yeah. then that was probably when I was like 10, maybe. Exactly. Right. And so then th a couple of years later, he started buying sports cars again. Mm -hmm. And that Mustang, man, that was sick. I, I, you had that car for a while and I got to drive that car in high school, uh, two or three times. And then me and you end up buying, uh, Mustangs, uh, mm -hmm. Had a turbo 05 GT. We had the supercharged 06 GT. We had the actual 07. 07 GT sorry. supercharged it. 04, the silver and black one. Oh, that's right. Yeah. The 04 GT. Yeah. Then we had a 750 Li. Yeah. Had a Dodge Ram Laramie. Yeah. Nissan Titan. Then I bought that Viper truck. And we bought the. Well, he goes, you guys can take it home for like two weeks. Yeah. I'm like, why am I driving a Viper truck for two <laughs> weeks? Stick shift and everything. Stick shift. Then we took it back, and then I can't remember what else we got. There was a lot of cars. We were like the number one buyers at CarMax. I for swear to God, like two years. They loved us. <laughs> They're like, man, every like three or four months, you come in here with a new car. <laughs> yeah, because right? yeah. oh, we got the um, Dodge Charger, the SRT8. Oh yeah, remember? We had a lot of very uh, retarded purchases. <laughs> <laughs> at least now it's my totally credit, different. My credit at the time was like seven eighty five. Yeah, we killed it. Yeah, just we have like how many auto loans do you have, sir? Sixty five. <laughs> wow, we didn't rent so, any of those out. <laughs> so you got fourteen cars. Yeah. Hmm. What is your job? <laughs> I don't have a job. I, I really don't. <laughs> Do you need a TV installation? Yeah. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, honestly, back, so uh, I was too young to have a business license. So I put my business in Robbie's name, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I started mounting TVs at Best Buy. So I was I was working at Best Buy, and I would sell flat panel TVs. And Best Buy at the time, I think they charged like $1,500, $2,000 to put on the wall. I just went, and I said, I'll do it for 500 bucks, and I'll just come over after work. So I was, TVs at that time were really heavy. So Robbie and I would go and mount the TVs and I got the tools and the stuff. And so we had this whole lifestyle from basically just mounting TVs. And I built like probably four or five big theaters, right? Uh, remember the pizza guy, his house we did? Yeah. Um, Bellagio, right? Bellagio's. 
Yeah, it was something well, like that. Yeah, it was a really good pizza. Yeah. And uh, he was the owner, and we yeah. mounted TVs in his whole house restaurant everywhere. Too, yeah, in the restaurant. And in his house. Yeah. So, um, I do have one question. Who cuts the best circles without tracing with their hand <laughs> with the drywall saw and actually can mount speaker? Who is it? Yeah, he, Robbie cut a, com I swear to you guys, I, to this day, I remember I could have never recreated. He cut a perfect circle, not looking just like this round, not looking, no, <laughs> no Sharpie, no tracing, nothing for I the speaker that. mounts. Yeah. Cause that's when we used to mount speakers in the ceiling. Yeah. And, uh, it, it was unbelievable. I, I swear to you, it was perfect eight inch circle. It was, it was pretty wild, but yeah, that's, it's funny. We both remember that it's a. You don't realize how much of your life you forget, but the one, two things you do remember are like the weirdest little things ever. Yeah. All right, Robbie, let's, let's switch gears. We don't need to talk about uh, the beginning for too much. Let's talk <laughs> about some couple current things. Sure. Tomorrow, we're flying to San Francisco. That's right. We're going to go and see, uh, we're actually going to like Palo Alto. Um, we're going to go and see Countach's. I bought a couple of Countach's earlier or the end of last year, and uh, I sent them to a world-renowned Countach restoration specialist. Uh, I've never even driven these cars. Uh, I've sat in the black one. The white one, I don't think I sat in, but um, we're getting them back to 100% fully. I mean, it's a quarter million dollars a piece to restore these things. It's no it's joke. Uh, so I wanted to check on the progress. Uh, I intended to sell them at Monterey. Maybe bring a trailer is better. I mean, Countach's are bringing almost a million dollars right now. And when I bought them, they were only bringing like four fifty, five hundred. dollars Cars on bring a trailer are fucking awesome, man. Honestly, I think bring a trailer has replaced every other car selling platform. I, that's all I look for when, when you talk I, about a car or something. I, I don't have the bandwidth to start a new business right now. But I would like to see people kind of mix auto trader and bring a trailer right? If I wanted to start like a royalty classifieds, I don't believe that cars should be fixed prices, right? Um, and I, I think that it actually works better for the buyer and the seller. If you posted a listing, like the problem with bring a trailer, and I don't mean anything negative, is I've got four cars that I wanted to sell and bring a trailer. I've got that gated manual 456. I've got two accurate NSXs, right? And then um, I have the uh, R35 Midnight Purple T-Spec GTR with uh, delivery miles, right? Um, I have the, the, the Millennium Jade one too, but I think I want to keep the Millennium Jade one. Um, but anyways, I have a handful of cars and I, I have a twin turbo Aventador S Roadster, right? I want to sell some of my cars because I'm, I'm getting another big car in the, in the next couple of weeks. And so it's three to four month process to put your car for sale and bring a trailer. And it has to go through like applications and they have to write like a story about it. And like, there's a lot of stuff to do. Plus you're paying, well, my listings are only $99 because I guess I did my own photography, but you have to pay between $99 and $2,000 depending on what package you choose. And like, if you have a really expensive car, they require themselves to do the photography, I think. But my point is, it's like, I have bought three things on Bring a Trailer so far. And I love this process because you really get to find out what the true value of something is when someone will pay for it. Let's just say the Pagani gearbox. I bought a Pagani Wyra gearbox on Bring a Trailer um, just to have a spare, you know, in case I need it in the future, right? I don't know. I don't have a Pagani yet, but I might get one soon. If they were to post that for like $30,000, I'd be like, nah, man, I don't need that thing for 30 grand. But it was like five grand and I bid on it five, six. I ended up paying like 9,500 bucks for it. I thought, okay, cool. Nine grand for a Pagani gearbox seems, seems like a good idea, yeah. you know? And so like when you look at all these prices of cars, some sell for much lower than expected. I've noticed that. Too. Some sell for astronomical prices. Why would Auto Trader or some big car selling brand not want to implement the auction style or offer style? Like should say, hey, the best offer on this car so far is $52,000. Like I don't want to ask you for a discount on your Porsche, right? Let's say I'm buying a Porsche. Yeah. And it's you have it posted for sixty grand, but I know it's worth forty four thousand. And I go in there, you're asking sixty, and I just I have to offer you forty four, and we have to argue about it. I have to do all that stuff. Like, I wish that they would just change it to where you can just make a high offer, right? Yeah. Post it for bids only or something. You know, I don't know. It's just something I was thinking about. Like, it just seems like there's a much better way to sell cars. I like uh, 
bring a trailer because all the pictures you take underneath the car, the undercarriage, the like every detail of the aspect, it says started first by the second owner, the third owner, and so on and so forth. It shows everybody else's, you know, bid, like you were talking about the bidding process. It, it also allows you to really understand the other um, cars similar on the market. So they, they show you a list of comparables, you know, it's, it's a really engaging environment to buy or sell a car. And I really like that process, but for it to take four months to sell your car is a lot. It's that very difficult. a long time. It is, you're right. Yeah, and, and I don't know if you know this, but after you win the auction, bring a chair is like, you're on your own. So it, it's like kind of like a weird thing where they're so involved in the front. But the second the auction is over, you have to now deal with- So they're basically the, saying like, go get your own car? No, like, yeah, like or, go, they don't facilitate shipping. They don't facilitate really? didn't know. Uh, escrow services, right? Yeah. They don't facilitate anything after the transaction. So like, it's, it's kind of like a complicated th scenario, t in my opinion, where they're so engaged in the beginning, the company itself, right. but after the auction's over, they're like, ah, oh, see you later, you got the next one. You know, they don't, they don't help you at the, in the back end. So they help you get the car in the front, but at the back end, they're like, they don't care. So like they just connect you with the owner and then you have to deal with it. You've got to send them money. You have to send them, you know, whatever the titles back and forth and yeah. all that stuff. So I do think that they need to kind of update their business model to where maybe add a $400 escrow service, right? Where they charge 400, they send the money and then they, you know, the other guy gets the title, they send there, then yeah. it exchanges, the cars get shipped and all that stuff. I think there's a better business model to be had. So if anybody that's watching my podcast wants to create a uh, competitor to bring a trailer, which I'm not really interested in doing, but I, <laughs> I would definitely like to be on the board uh, of directors of that company and give a lot of opinions um, because I think that uh, I could really help this type of industry grow. This is great for our first podcast. I think it was right? pretty cool. We talked about uh, things, uh, emotional things, family drama, new businesses, old businesses, right? These are what these podcasts are all about. People so. want to see us doing this type of stuff because it's one-on-one -on -one with them and it's real. Like, I didn't even know what we we're going to come in talking about. We're actually more like, what are we doing? And Honestly, like, neither did I. We, we literally had no plan. Just literally, um, it was like, go. Yeah. Okay, we're two chairs, a engine block, a line with a crown, and in Houston. That's yeah. the name of our show. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thanks for joining me. And uh, let's, thanks for joining me. Let's get a couple more of these going this week, Mario.